She's been Premier of Ontario for almost 16 months, and it has not been an easy time for Ontario's 25th Premier. Plagued with the continuing gas plant scandal and the constant threat that the plug would be pulled on her minority government at any time. Nevertheless, the Liberal leader thinks she has a good story to tell on education, on building public transit, and on running a lean government. And with that, we welcome Kathleen Wynne back to TVO. Nice Thank to have you, you here. Steve. Great to be here. Let's start with this. I'd like to open with a kind of a broad question. So are you asking the voters to render a verdict on the past 16 months of Kathleen Wynne-led government or the past 11 years of Liberal administration? I'm taking my plan to the people of Ontario, Steve. Um, you know, I'm, I'm asking them to look at what I have done in the last 16 months and most of all look at the plan that, uh, that we're laying out. And it's a, you know, it's a plan to invest in the people and in the infrastructure and in the businesses in this province. But that doesn't mean I'm not proud of the work that I uh, did when I was Minister of Education, when I was Minister of Transportation and Municipal Affairs and Housing and Aboriginal Affairs. You know, I'm very proud of, of the repair that we did to the fabric of uh, of our public services in Ontario. When we came into office in 2003, and you know, I got involved because I was so concerned about what was happening to publicly funded education, what was happening to the relationship between the province and municipalities, and I wanted to be part of a government that was going to repair those things, and we have. We've, we've, got, we've got great outcomes in education. We've got 83% of kids graduating from high school. We have a, a very good partnership with municipalities and we're, we're repairing a lot of the damage that was done and, and have. But I'm bringing my plan, uh, I'm bringing my integrity and uh, my vision for the province to the people. If I've heard it once though, I've heard it a hundred times while I've been out there on the hustings. I like that Kathleen Wynne, but oh my goodness, that party needs to be sent to the penalty box. And I wonder what you would say to people who like you and think you're okay, but really are sick to death of e-health and gas plants and orange and feel a need to send the Liberals packing for a while. Well, you know, I, I get that, uh, that there are people who are angry about, uh, about those things, about one or more of those things. I, I get that, but, but I, also, I also want people to know that we have made changes as a result of those. You know, the, I think the test of a government or a politician or a person is whether you learn from situations, you know? And there isn't a government in the history of the world that hasn't done some things that they should have done differently. And so I have made changes in the last 16 months that I have been in office. Uh, I've made changes to make sure that, uh, particularly in the case of the, uh, of the relocation of the gas plants, because that's been something that we've really dealt with over the last 16 months, I've made changes to ensure that that doesn't happen again, including bringing in legislation, including changing the rules around locating uh, big pieces of infrastructure and working with communities. So I would ask people to look at that and then look at our plan, which really is a plan about investment. And quite frankly, Steve, this election's coming down to some pretty stark choices. You know, it's coming down to some stark choices between, uh, between our plan, which is a plan of investment in building up the province, and the Conservatives, which begins with firing 100,000 people and, and really is based on a, a flawed math error. Well, and in fairness, the, they're not going to fire 100,000 people the first day they take office. They're going to eliminate no. 100,000 positions over four years. Well, okay, but that, that's what they say. Yeah, that, that is an enormous hit to our communities. I met with mayors today from Owen Sound, uh, from Kenora, from Vaughan, uh, Timmins called in, the mayor of Capascasing was here, we had the mayor of Oakville, a whole range of mayors. They're very worried, Steve, that if the Conservatives get in, if Tim Hudak has his way, then they will see a repeat of the downloading of services onto municipal property taxes onto communities that cannot afford to pay those, uh, pay those bills. And we've been trying to reverse that. We've been trying to reestablish the relationship between province and municipalities. And they're very worried that if Tim Hudak has his way, that will all be undone. When you say repeat, you're referring, of course, to the Mike Harris years. I am. You referenced him in the I debate am. the other night. If it's okay to say you get Hudak, then it's Mike Harris all over again, 
Why is it not okay for people to say, if you put Wynn back in, it's McGinty and all of his problems all over again? Well, I, you know, here's the thing. And that question has been asked of me many times. Um, and I have been very clear that, just as I said to you, I'm proud of the work that, uh, that we did in education and in healthcare. There were some things that we did that I am not proud of and that I think should have been done very differently. And I've been clear about those. That's not what Tim Hudek is saying. He's running on a platform that replicates and in fact goes farther than what Mike Harris did. So that's the difference. If, if Tim Hudak were saying, no, here are the ways in which I'm different than Mike Harris and I'm, I'm not going to cut those frontline services and I am going to have a, a good working partnership with municipalities, that's not what he's saying. He's saying he's, he's pretty happy with everything that he did under Harris. He wants to do it again and go farther. Let's talk about those frontline services, because you did an event earlier this week where you were, I think it was in Don Mills at the it Prince was. Hotel, and you had, I think, about 70 people, everything from teachers, nurses, uh, paramedics behind you, uh, showing that public services were basically with you. I know you've been critical, you mentioned it again just a second ago, about the 100,000 positions Tim Hudak wants to eliminate. However, we have to point out that in the third year of the budget plan that you introduced, you yourself are calling for an $800 million spending decrease in program spending in order to balance the books by 1718. How do you do that and not cut any public services at all? So, so we do it in the way that we have been doing it for the last few years. So if you look at, look at this year's numbers, or 12, um, 13, 14, we, we were looking for a uh, billion dollars in savings, we actually found a billion and a half because the changes that we're making, Steve, are structural. They are changes in the way we deliver service. So if we look at health care, the kinds, of, the kinds of, of changes we're making are in the way we deliver home care, for example, the, the way we, uh, we deliver services to el the elderly, making sure that we take services out of hospital that don't need to be in hospital, put them in the community, make sure people get the services where they need them, when they need them. Now, that has the great benefit of providing better health care, but it also saves money. And so those kinds of changes are the, are the things that we are doing. And we have overachieved every single year in terms of the targets that we've set for ourselves. We'll continue to do that. We will continue to find ways to change the way we deliver service and do it in a, in a better way. But we're not going to slash across the board, which is what Tim Hudak says he's going to do. He's just going to take a percentage across the board, and that is indiscriminate cutting. No, that I, is not what we're going to do. I get that, but if you take away the position, if you take away the ministries that you say you want to protect, health care, for example, is going to get a small increase. Education is going to get a small increase. But there, there's a basket of ministries that must be 80% of the number of ministries where you're cutting their budgets by 6%. I don't know, which is why I'm asking, how you cut spending in those ministries by 6% without laying anybody off or cutting well, services. Well, what I, what I will say to you is that we, are, we have uh, put constraints in place year over year. We will continue to have those constraints in place. We are we're absolutely committed to not, um, not increasing uh, wages and salaries. We've said to the uh, public service employees there is no new money in the budget for uh, salaries and, and wage increases, and that's hard. You know, that's not, that's not an easy thing for, uh, for employees to hear, but they know what our fiscal situation is, and they know that we believe in collective bargaining, and we're going to have, we're going to have those difficult discussions at the bargaining table respecting the process. But, you know, we are the leanest government in the country, and I know that's, uh, that's something that I've said many times, but, you know, it's important for people to recognize that, that we understand that program spending has to be kept low. We understand how to do that, and... As I say, year over year, we have found ways to continue to do that. But here's the thing, Steve. What we also know is that if we're going to encourage the recovery that we're seeing right now, because we are slowly recovering from the economic downturn, there are some investments that need to be made. We need to make sure that uh, people have access to post-secondary education, that they have the best education system in the world. When I go to businesses, uh, it's pretty much the first thing 
business owners will say to me, I need, we need to have an educated workforce. We need that stream of workers coming into our business who have a great education. So making sure that we make those investments, making sure that we invest in infrastructure. And by that, I mean the roads and the bridges and the transit. The mayor of uh, Kenora will tell you he can't grow his economy if his bridges are crumbling. He just can't do that because tourism is really important to him. He needs, he needs businesses to be able to count on their infrastructure. So making those investments and in the GTHA, you know if we don't invest in transit, we're not going to be able to grow. So, so those investments are critical right now. Let me follow up on that because once upon a time, I do remember you coming into the studio and saying, Ontario needs to have an adult conversation about establishing new revenue streams that are separate from what we have right now in order to pay for public transit. You appointed uh, Ann Golden to chair a task force mm -hmm. to look into recommendations. She came back with a bunch of ideas. As far as I can tell, probably three quarters to 80% of the ideas that came forward for new permanent revenue streams to pay for new infrastructure, you've taken off the table. I presume because they've been too politically unpalatable. So do you conclude that we're actually not ready for this adult conversation? So she, what, what Ann Golden and her, um, her group said to us was, there are a number of ways that you can uh, raise revenue. And you're right. We said uh, that raising gas, the, ga the price of gas, or raising HST was not viable. It was not viable for the very reasons that I was just talking about in terms of we're just beginning to recover. People are still feeling the, uh, the effects of the, uh, the economic downturn. And so that's not viable. But she also said there's some other things that you can do. You know, she said you need to look at, you need to look at repurposing revenue that is, uh, that's already in place. So taking uh, some gas tax or HST and, and using that. She said uh, leveraging, doing some borrowing if necessary. Um, and we have, we've taken those ideas and we're going to use those ideas. And you will know that in our budget, we've also, we've also determined that we need to ask the top 2% of people in the province to uh, top 2% of earners in the province to pay a bit more. So, so we have, we have, uh, tackled the uh, the revenue it's issue. It's not a new revenue stream though. No. I mean, you were pretty clear about that well, when you campaigned well, on it once there's upon a, there's a time. A, there's, a, there's a bit of that in terms of, you know, we still have high occupancy toll lanes in the in the budget. Um, we've got some aviation fuel uh, increases in the budget. So there are some things that we have uh, that we have said we, you know, we need to get some revenue from. We've also said that uh, creating some dedicated funds, and that was another thing that uh, that Ann Golden suggested, that we, uh, that we if we're going to sell assets like our shares in GM or like real estate, that we take that money and we put it in a dedicated fund, one for the GTHA, one for outside of the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, and that we make sure that people know how that money is being spent, how much money is there, and what the projects are that we're going to spend it on. I, I, I really want to know what happened here, though, because I got a feeling you were gung-ho to make this happen, and then you went to caucus and they said to you, absolutely not, we're going into an election, and they persuaded you to back down on it and that's actually, why it's not happening. You know, actually, the reason it's not happening is, is just what I said, that it, it wasn't viable at this point. It wasn't viable in because a minority of... Parliament? You no, know, because, of, because of what people are experiencing right now and the, the reality that the broad swath of middle-class families are struggling. I mean, it's why, it's why we've got a 30% off tuition grant, you know, because middle-income families want their kids to go to post-secondary, but they need some support on that. Drummond says it's a waste of money. Well, Drummond says he may... it doesn't help access at all. <laughs> well, hey, he recommended you get rid of it. You actually, didn't take his advice. Actually, it's, you know, it's tens of thousands of young people who are helped, and I have people all the time. I had, a, I had a single mom come up to me today and say, thank you for the 30% off tuition grant, because it means that her child can go to post-secondary and is not going to be carrying the same debt. So, so it depends where you're sitting, whether it's, it has utility or not. Uh, okay, Drummond would probably say it hasn't helped access at all. Certainly helps on the debt side, but you haven't. Have you really helped with the, with the hundreds of millions that that's going to cost? Have you really helped anybody go to post secondary who wouldn't otherwise be going? Well, that's a that's a question for the researchers. I mean, our <laughs> our accessibility in terms of post secondary has increased hugely since 2003. Part of that is putting grants in place that we did when we first came in, and part of it is the 30% off tuition grant. Can I ask you what the most difficult decision you have made as Premier has been? 
Oh my goodness, that's like the, when, in the surveys during the election, you know, what's your favorite book? What's your, <laughs> very hard questions to answer. Um, the most difficult decision uh, that I have had to make. Um, you know, there are there are difficult decisions every day. Um, I think that I think that you know we are we're talking about um, investments in the future, and probably the decisions around what we were going to put in the budget and how we were going to frame the investments that we needed to make. I mean, those those were difficult decisions because we were balancing we're balancing then the commitment to eliminate the deficit by 2017, and the commitment to continue to invest in the people of this province and to invest in our economy. And finding that, just that sweet spot that would allow us to do both, um, I, I think in terms of keeping me up at night, that was probably the, the most difficult series of uh, discussions. Now, Charles Souza would probably say, well, you think you had it hard. <laughs> what about him? Because he was, carrying the, he was carrying the load, you know, and he worked so hard on that budget. But I'm convinced, Steve, that we found the right combination of investments, you know? I mean, I have said all along that the economy for me is, it is about the, it's about the tax structure, and it's about the business income, and it's about those those really hard numbers. But it's also about the well-being of people. So in our budget is money for developmental services, people with developmental um, disabilities. That's and not a hard decision to make, though. That who, was not no. Who would not want to well, do more on that? Well, but it is a hard decision to make in the sense that uh, we have a very difficult fiscal situation. But but I'm committed to an economy that addresses all of those issues, that, uh, that puts the right business supports in place, that builds transit, that puts the right constraints in place so that we balance by 2017-18, but also is compassionate enough so that we bring everyone along with us. That's a, that's a challenge. I, I only ask the question because th there have been people who've emailed me and said every time Kathleen Wynne sort of looked like she was going to take a very bold, strong position on something, for example, creating new revenue tools to pay for infrastructure. She took us to the precipice, and then, instead of leaping, she backed down. Well, and uh, what are the other examples, though? I mean, in terms of the most difficult personal decision, probably the first most difficult position is forming a cabinet. You know, that is, that is a hugely difficult, uh, difficult task. But in terms of things I said I was going to do when I came into this office, I said we were going to have dedicated revenue for transit. We have dedicated revenue for transit. I said I was going to change the rules around citing electricity infrastructure. We've done that. I said that we were going to introduce a budget that uh, addressed the challenges of our economy. I've done that. So I've taken on I've taken on some pretty challenging things. You know, the the retirement pension plan. Uh, I raised that issue very early in my uh, in my term in this office. I, I raised it with the other premiers at the Council of the Federation. We talked about it across the country and tried to get Stephen Harper to work with us. I haven't backed down on that. I've put that in my budget and I'm very committed to doing that if we're reelected. Okay. A few minutes left I want to touch on two more things. What for you is the lesson in the debacle that is Mars? Well, <laughs> first, let me say that that was a, it's a real estate transaction that hadn't been completed. And quite frankly, Steve, Tim Hudak decided that he was going to release those documents. I, you know, however he got them, who knows? Uh, he was going to release those documents on a, a transaction that had not been completed because he was trying to distract from his extremely flawed platform. Okay, that's, is, that's the reality. But is and, there a, and, and, and you know, you just, you just have to know that we're, we're committed to investing in the innovation that's going on at Mars. We're committed to the second phase of Mars. The reality is that there's a building there. Uh, we've got a lot of government services in other rented space that we can put into that, uh, put into that building. So Infrastructure Ontario was in the process of, uh, of a real estate transaction that was in the best interests of the province. Okay, but do we need public servants working in one of the most expensive buildings on some of the most expensive land in the whole country? Is well, that, is that a good we idea? Have, here's the thing. We have a, we have a hub in that, on that corridor of medical and scientific research. And so in the first instance, that's why Mars was located there. So that's why it's expanding there. What, what we've said is um, we also should use that building and, and to the greatest degree possible consolidate uh, functions, government functions that are in other expensive buildings. Let's put them all in one. Okay. Last thing. 
Uh, I don't like getting into the what-if stuff, and I know we can go hypotheticals <laughs> the until the cows come home. So I don't want to do that. But, but the reality is people elect parliaments. They don't elect governments. Right. And I wonder, you've got one leader in the past parliament whom you're suing for libel. That's Tim Hudak. You've got another leader in the past parliament in Andrea Horvath who suddenly halfway through the campaign started to say the Liberal Party is corrupt and you're at the center of it all. Ontarians may be wondering if it is another minority parliament, how are any of you supposed to work with each other when there is this much blood in the water? Well, first of all, it cannot be personal. I mean, I'm, I'm in this job, I'm in this work because I believe in the public good and I believe that my sole responsibility is to act in the best interest of the people of the province. I wouldn't be here otherwise and so whatever happens on June 12th, obviously I'm going for a strong mandate. I want a strong mandate and I want to implement our plan. I believe it's the best plan for the people of the province at this juncture in our history. But whatever the people of Ontario decide, I will work in that configuration. Whoever gets the most seats has the right to form government, uh, and I will I will work with I will work with the uh, the other parties. You can work with a guy who you're suing well, for libel. You know, here's the thing. I have said to Tim Hudak all along, I'm happy to debate the issues and I'm happy to debate facts. When you make false allegations and false accusations, that's not that's not on. You know, I'm not going to stand for that. I'm only going to debate the facts with you, and that will continue to be my position, and we will debate the facts to the best of our ability. But in the meantime, between now and June 12th, I'm going to go for a strong mandate. That's my plan. And my plan is to thank you for coming. Thank and you. as I have with all the leaders, to wish you luck on the 12th of January. Thank you. January. June. June. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Not my head? <laughs> no, we don't want to go another six months through <laughs> the election. Anyway, Kathleen thank Wynn, you. leader of the Liberals, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.